at the rest stop. Exit the traffic, turn off your engine, and tune in to words that will ease your mind. Beloved, loved ones, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. This is Joe Weidinger along with Becky today, and we're going to dis- continue our discussion about prosperity, but as we do that, you need to understand that you are loved. You are loved by God. That in itself begins to give you an understanding that you will prosper. Love, the desire of love, is always to prosper, to be successful, to have everything that you need in life. And so last week we talked about the curse and that the first thing, man, and Jesus coming to this earth and dying on a cross, raising from the dead, ascending into heaven, is that the curse, he took the curse upon himself and removed that. And that curse, as Becky discussed, has a lot to do with poverty. Yeah, last time we talked about the curse being broken and the scriptural foundation for that so that we have in print, black and white, exactly what the Lord has promised because the word of God is where our faith is and what we trust in and use to obtain the promises because if you don't know what his word says, then you can't fight the fight of faith, and you'll never believe or know who God really is. And so I wanted to have laid the foundation for why we can believe and know and be confident that God does want us to have plenty. He wants us to have an abundance for ourselves and to help other people. And so we started out in 2 Corinthians verse uh, chapter 8 and verse 9, Uh, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for for your sakes he became poor, that uh, you through his poverty might be rich. And rich means in this uh, scripture, it means wealthy, abounding with and increased with goods. And from the base word that means money, abundance, possessions, richness, valuable bestowment. It means riches. In fact, I would really encourage you to read that whole chapter of uh, 2 Corinthians 8 because he is talking so specifically about money that you you can't escape it. And I know a lot of people, um, they'll teach this because when it talks about he became poor, that we can be rich, they are, they don't they think it means other things. They just can't wrap their minds around that it means money, but he is talking about money. He's not talking about, we know in the, in the broader sense, of course, God's blessing means all kinds of goodness in our lives from love and relationships and fulfillment and all the enjoyment of life. But in this place, he is talking about cash. (laughs) <laughs> so then Jesus became poor at the cross. I don't believe it was because he became a human being that he became poor, but he took on poverty. If you understand the gospel, you understand that he took on the curse. Then uh, in Deuteronomy uh, 28 and 48, it talks about all the curses. But in that particular scripture, it talks about poverty, and it describes poverty. And so he took on the curse, the curse of poverty then. He broke all the curse, but he he broke the curse of poverty according to Galatians 3 and verses 13 and 14. You know, Jesus has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Well, Deuteronomy 28, 48 describes that curse. It defines the curse of poverty. And when he became the curse and broke it, remember he took curse to its, in, to its end, which is death. The curse always brings death. It takes you to death. And so he took cur- the curse to the very end, which was death. He died. The curse 
overcame him and killed him. But because he was pure and righteous, the son of God, he rose from the dead because the curse couldn't hold him. And he overcame death, hell, and the grave, and he overcame the curse so that, according to Galatians, that all the promises of Abraham can come to us. And the promises of Abraham, if you read those in the Old Testament, particularly in Genesis um, I believe it's uh, chapter 24 and verse 1. It says that Abraham was blessed in all ways, in everything. And so we know uh, one of the things about Abraham that is always uh, characteristic of him is that he was very wealthy. He had lots of wealth. And so we can have those same promises because the curse has been broken. I think the important fact that uh, in reading that scripture that my soul prospers that i prosper and be in health as my soul prospers i was listening to a famous actress uh, today uh, an actress that was raised in real poverty they never had anything you know the typical mindset of poverty and she began to describe she became a successful actress and today she is uh, extremely wealthy. And she said that every day I have to remind myself that I'm not poor. So poverty and wealth has so much more to do than just having money. Uh, it's a spiritual thing. It's a, a spiritual attitude, atmosphere, mindset that we begin to walk in and as believers in the body of Christ, the community of faith, we are a very wealthy family. The reason we are wealthy is because God is wealthy. He owns everything. He created everything. He, he is uh, wealthy beyond measure. Uh, and sometimes, uh, as you said, Becky, that you know, we want to just look at the spiritual side of it, which is, which is very important because that's dealing with the spirit. But for some reason, we just think God's at war with money, that Christians are supposed to walk in poverty or lack. And when you talk the way we've been talking about the curse involved, physical and spiritual dynamics and he removed that and replaced it. It, it that was swallowed up by the goodness and the wealth of God so as our soul prospers it is beginning to see God in a way where he's not poor he's not broke he has everything and he is our source I want to read I want to read this one scripture uh, and then I want to explore the thing about the goodness of God. It's in 1 Timothy chapter 6. It says, Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good, that they may be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. Now there's a lot there. But he starts out by saying command. That's not a good word. It's actually a word to say I urge you or I direct you. Command is almost like it, it's, a, it's a strong word that man if I don't do this I'm going to fall into trouble or I'm going to be disobedient. And, and that is not at all what the word means the the original actually is i charge you it's the same word used in verse 13 where he says i urge you in the sight of god that that urge you so paul is writing and he's urging those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty so there i think he's warning he he's not against those that are rich. he's not saying well, I urge those who are rich, give everything away to the poor and follow Jesus. He's, he's saying the danger of having richness or riches, wealth, is you become haughty. In other words, you begin to be puffed up because of your wealth. 
and you begin to trust in the money instead of the living God. What's, what is your take on that verse? Well, you know, there's a scripture in Hebrews that kind of says the same thing. Uh, Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5, he says, that Paul says, let your conduct be uh, without covetousness. So he's talking about being covetous and be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. So it goes to the, the very... Um, bedrock of what we're looking for. We're looking for security, I believe. We're looking for that we're safe. We'll always yeah. have enough. We'll be provided for. And because because if we trust in the living God, then, and he said, I'll never leave you or forsake you, that's really the ultimate truth here. This is This goes deeper even even than what I taught about him breaking the curse and that we can have abundance because why did he break the curse? Because he loves us. He's our father. He wants us to be free. So even breaking the curse, what Jesus did came out of his love and his care and his concern for us. And so it all still goes back to knowing God and his nature. It's interesting you said that we want security because back in verse 17 of uh, 1 Timothy, he says, I urge those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty nor to trust in uncertain riches. The word uncertain means not safe. It's insecure. So he's saying that the money, the riches that God gives us does not produce security. I could have millions of dollars and still be in fear and insecure. And this is shown all in the, in the world today, and maybe as believers that's why we think, well, I don't need money because God is my security. That is absolutely true. God is your security. By, but to say I don't need money is really a indictment I believe against God because God wants to bless he already gave us Jesus I mean you can't you can't get any better than that so to have money you have to have money in this world you have to have money to buy uh, to uh, buy food to live in a house and yet we we think money is evil we think money is something that we are to run away from instead of knowing that our Father wants to bless us with money, so not only needs are met, but as the Scripture says, that I'm ready to do good works. And it's interesting when you read it. I encourage you, the listening, to, to get your Bible and really read that because he uses the word rich, richly, several times. Riches and richly. He gives us God, the living God, gives us richly all things to enjoy. He gives us all things, things. That's not just something spiritual, that's material. He gives us this house. I have a house to enjoy, a car to enjoy, uh, money to enjoy. But my security and my peace comes from the living God. And then it goes on, he says, that I may be rich in good works. So there, it is such a tremendous connection because there's nothing greater, I think, than to have finances where you can go up to someone and really bless them. Not, not give them $5, which would be great, but maybe pay off a mortgage. Wouldn't that be fantastic? You're maybe even someone that you're trying to witness to and they're in debt and you go up to them and you say, hey, look, Jesus loves you. And I want to pay off your mortgage. I think I think that that person would begin to believe in God, even if he was an atheist. Well, God's goodness is one thing that the devil constantly tries to downplay because <clears throat> the issue is always what's true and what's not. What's what do I believe? 
And Satan is our enemy. He comes to deceive and to destroy, and he's always lying to us about God. He lied to Eve about God. That's the very beginning was, did he really say this? Is he really who he says he is? And he actually there is saying, you know, he's really being kind of stingy to you. And yeah. that's, that's what he was trying to convince her of. And that's, that's this, that God's not good or that he's stingy, <clears throat> that he's a dictator, that he's critical, that he's cruel, that he's always on our case, he's always judging and criticizing and accusing us, and we're just constantly, he, you know, he, that's the picture that Satan tries to paint of God, our Father. And he, the Lord himself, is constantly trying to lead us into truth. You know, Jesus said, I'll send the Holy Spirit, and he will lead you into truth, and that's that's our soul prospering, our soul coming into revelation of what is true, who is God, really, and not ha and have the revelation of his true nature. Because, you know, in Exodus, way back in Exodus, the Lord himself defined himself to Moses. And he said, the Lord God, I am the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth. And if you don't fundamentally believe that he is good or you just have doubts about it because we measure God's goodness, we measure God's goodness by how our life is going. Yeah. And this whole thing about God being generous and kind and abundance with money and, and blessing, when you don't have any and you're going through and maybe for a long time gone through real severe financial crisis, it is a tough thing to push through that and to stand on the Word of God and not what you see. God being good. You know, back, we don't hear it so much today. God is good all the time. God is good. We had a little phrase, if you remember that phrase. and it, uh, I didn't care so much for that, but God is good. I, what kind of exercises, what, what can I do to really begin to see God being good? I, I know that several years ago, this is just me. I mean, we all have the way the Lord deals with us, leads us, speaks to us. But I remember a, a very specific time when it kind of came to that crisis in me. And I've been serving God for many, many years. But I realized that underneath that I felt like there were, that I didn't think God was good, at least in certain ways, because of the way my life was going. I thought, how, you know, that old thing, how can God be good if this is happening to me? Right. And so then I thought, you know, he says I'm good. He says I abound in goodness. So if he says, I'm good, that's true, then I said, God, you have to show me then. You have to reveal this to me because right now I'm telling you, Lord, I don't think you're very good. And I'm really kind of mad at you. <laughs> and, and he did. And he's continuing to open that up to me. He, he leads us in paths of righteousness for his namesake. And Jesus said that the Holy Spirit will lead us into truth. He leads us into truth. So there's more and more and more to understand. We don't we get the whole thing when we get saved, but unpacking it and discerning it all takes a lifetime. Well, what did he do? How did that come across? I mean, you said that he revealed his goodness. Is there something specific or even today that reminds you of his goodness or well, oddly enough, um, right then, right about that time, you went to a conference that was talking about a journey into God. Into God, into yeah. Into God. Uh -huh. And it was not of our persuasion at all. It was a whole different group of people that we weren't, we had never really aligned ourselves with before, but 
it was the most amazing thing because you came back telling me these things. They were teaching about the goodness of God. So that was a first step. You showed me some things about anything good, and it does not matter if it comes from people who don't even know God or who don't have any relationship with God, but anything good in the earth is a reflection of God. It's right. a reflection of him. And I began to think about that, and I began to see it here and there, and I think, man, I never thought about... I mean, you read Romans, the first part, he talks so much about how just creation itself is so abundant and so diverse and so magnificent. That's the goodness of God. Well, I never looked at creation that way. Mm -hmm. Creation's just, uh, you know, we just live here on the earth. But <laughs> I began to see <laughs> the magnificence of the creation, just the creation and how that is good. And then in turn, the creation provides all the resources we need to live. What if we lived in a barren desert where there weren't, there was no uh, beauty? I mean, there's even beauty in the desert. See, but, it's, it's, it's amazing. But the Lord took me through s steps. He taught me because I asked him to. So I think fundamentally we first have to ask him for revelation because you can't even really figure it out or see it uh, on, your, on your own. Well, I'd like us to pray. Because I believe prosperity begins by the revelation that God is good. Yes, absolutely. And the retreat you mentioned, I, I, one thing that sticks out in my memory that was really, it was really neat, because they had chocolate uh, from Germany, and this is, I mean, this is rare chocolate, very expensive chocolate. And they had enough for all of us to take a piece out of this box. And so there's, oh, I can't remember, 50 people, maybe maybe a little bit more. But we all had a piece of chocolate. And then they said, taste that chocolate or go ahead and eat it. And we ate it. And man, I'd enjoyed it. I just, I didn't even chew it. I just kind of let it melt my mouth, you know, and that real, really great chocolate. And, and you could hear people just going, mm, 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 you know, and uh, the uh, teacher began to say, now that tasted good, didn't it? And he used the scripture, taste of the Lord and see that he is good. And I'm reminded of the rich young man that came to Jesus. See, here we talk about money. Here's a man that had money, and he called Jesus a good teacher. Jesus responded by saying, no one's good but God. There's only one that's good, and that is God. So all the goodness in this world comes first from God. So my taste buds, how simple that is and how diverse food is, that food just doesn't taste diff the same all over. That chocolate bar didn't taste like a hamburger. Everything has distinct taste and God created that, how good he is, just that. So I believe that by praying the Lord will begin to make you more and more aware of how good God is and how good life is as a believer and even those that don't even believe in God, how good God is. Let me just read a scripture that speaks to that because the, it, it is so, God is so merciful to his entire creation and to every person because we're all created in the image of God and we really are all children of God but most people don't have relationship with their father that's the distinction between those who do and those who don't but he's good to all of us and because in Luke chapter 6 verse 35 it's he says uh, Jesus said this he said God is kind to the unthankful and the evil now that that has to change our minds. I really think we don't believe that. I think we believe God's mad and angry, and and there's old sermons that you know uh, the sinner hanging in the in the flames of hell, and God is about to cut the string, and he's going to fall. 
we have this picture of God that he's mad and ticked off and he's just going to burn up the earth. And yet here he is, the kind and good, even, say that verse again. Uh, it's, it's Luke 6, 35. He says, Jesus said that God the Father, he is kind to the unthankful and the evil. And in, in Romans, Paul talks about that too. He says, do you despise the riches of his goodness and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance. If we believe the goodness of God, it changes it changes the way we think, it, obviously. It changes the way we think, and that begins to prosper. And when God's good to us, he's constantly good to the whole earth. He's constantly, I believe, his goodness is there to, um, to bring people to him if they just see it. But the devil lies to them, and for all myriads of reasons, they, they don't come to him or they believe the lie. Um, well, honey, would you close in prayer today for this and that we would begin to see the goodness of God? Father, we come to you, Lord, and we do ask you to give us revelation of your goodness. Yes. We can't even see it on our own, but God, we want to know who you really are. And that's what Paul said in Philippians. He said to know you, that's the goal in life. And one of the biggest lies Satan tells people and tells us continually that you aren't and that you're stingy or that you're um, judgmental and judging and cruel and constantly trying to correct us and discipline us. And that means hard spankings. And, but God, I, I know that there we have to have your perspective on all of those things. I know that you expect obedience and you expect us to be conformed into the image of your son but Jesus had the perfect revelation of you as his father and that's what I want to have I want to have I want to know you the way Jesus your firstborn son knows you and have the real the truth true understanding of the goodness of God that then changes my mind and I understand that you are kind that you are abounding in goodness and truth. Amen. Right.